Hey everyone, so in this video we're talking about profile guided optimizations where you run the program either after compiling it or just in an interpreter and as you do so you collect profile information and then later you use that profile information to compile the program efficiently. Profile guided optimizations happen in a few scenarios, the most common of which is this one, a profiling just-in-time compiler. This is for the Java Virtual Machine, which profiles during interpretation. We've seen this chart a bunch of times at this point, so I won't comment further. Interestingly, it's also possible to do a ahead of time compilation with profiles. The idea is that you compile your program in profiling mode, you run it to collect profiling information, then you compile it again with the profile information. The profile is used to make assumptions about what is common and uncommon, and so what specialized version to optimize. So what's being profiled? First, the number of calls to each method and the number of loop iterations. Counting the loop iteration is necessary because even if a method is called only once, if there's a loop that performs millions of iterations, you want to optimize it as soon as possible. And by the way, that does lead to an interesting challenge. With it that the function is only called once but iterates a lot, then you can compile it. But you might have to switch from the slow interpreted version to the fast compiled version while the method is executing. This is called uh, unstack replacement or OSR. Another thing that is commonly profiled and is particularly important in object-oriented languages is the concrete type of object. So what you get from object.get class in Java as opposed to the declare static type. In Java, once you have the concrete type, that fully determines the actual core target, so the actual method implementation for virtual calls. Another thing that can be profiled is the probability that each branch of a conditional gets taken. And that basically lets you hint the CPU on which branch it should predict. So what about the values that we compute? Should we try to cache some values from the profile run? We can do that, but we should only do it if the values are stable, meaning that they won't change, they won't change often, or only a few different values will be used. Sometimes we don't know about that in advance, and so we might start recording values until the point where we see many different values and then we just give up. We will see later in this video when it actually makes sense to perform this caching. And when we do this, these values are stored in something we call polymorphic inline caches. So how do we use all of this information? For the call and loop count, it's very simply a matter of determining and prioritizing which functions to compile. If a function is not called enough, it's not worth to expend resources trying to compile it. If, on the other hand, we have many functions to compile, we want to prioritize those that are called the most. With concrete types, we can perform what we call monomorphization. Let's use Java as an example. In Java, any non-static, non-final method is considered polymorphic because there are potentially multiple implementations of the method. For instance, it can be overridden in a subclass. Using the profile information, for each method call, we know the concrete types used for the receiver of the method. It may be that we encounter only one such concrete type. In this case, the call is said to be monomorphic. If there are two such types, the call is bimorphic. You can go ahead and do trimorphic, etc. But at some point, you have to draw a limit. And you see that all calls with more concrete types than the limit are megamorphic. The goal of monomorphization is to replace those polymorphic calls that are not megamorphic by one or more non-polymorphic calls. So those are calls where we know exactly which method of which class will be called. Let's take the case of monomorphic calls. First, we add a check that the concrete type is indeed the type that we've always seen so far. Sometimes this is not necessary because we know there is only one implementation and that new implementations cannot be added later. Note that this is not the case in Java where you can dynamically load new classes at runtime. Then we can call the call target directly to the implementing method in the Java example. We gain two things by doing this. First, we do not need to perform a potentially expensive lookup. And second, because we know the exact code that is called, we can potentially inline it. But say the function is bimorphic instead. Well, then we replace the lookup by type checks on the known type. So for instance, a call to a method becomes a type check for the first type in which case we call the implementation for that type. Or, so it is a else if, basically, 
a type check on the second type, in which case we call the implementation for the second type. Just like in the monomorphic case, we need to guard against the case where a new type is introduced. In those cases, we could fall back to the polymorphic type, but this would prevent some optimization. Instead, we typically chose to deoptimize the function in that case. So in Java's case, we go back to the interpreter, and if we decide to compile the function again, we just leave the polymorphic call as is. Again, the advantage is avoiding the cost of the lookup and having the possibility to inline the two call targets. You can do this for more than two types, but as the number of type increases, the benefits start dropping fast because you're generating too much code and that pollutes the cache. So like we said, when you encounter a megamorphic call, you just don't do anything and you won't be able to inline the methods. So far, we've always implicitly assumed that we were compiling and optimizing a statically typed language. So what about dynamically typed language? You can in fact compile them, but consider that in many dynamic language, the code we need to emit for a simple add operation is all this messy thing. So in this example, if both operands are just integer, you just add them. And if at least one of the operands is string, then you ensure that both are strings and you concatenate them. Otherwise, as a fallback, you try to call the add method on the A object. And presumably, if this method does not exist, the language will spit out an error at runtime. And it's like this for every single operation in your language. For instance, if you want to index an error in Ruby, it's not enough to just check that the index is an integer. You must also check if it can't implicitly be converted to an integer by calling a user-defined method, sort of like the add method here. This is all very bad for performance. First of all, it's a lot of code, which takes precious code cache space, meaning we'll have more code cache misses, meaning worse performance. You can't inline much, because if you do, then you really kill your code cache. And this adds a lot of control flow, so conditionals, all over the place, which prevents you from having nicely optimizable basic blocks. Every instruction can be reached in so many different ways that it's hard to make any assumption at all. The solution to that particular problem is to use specialization. Christian Humer talked a fair deal about specialization in Truffle in his presentation for this course, so if you haven't seen it, I highly suggest that you check it out, and I'll put the link in the description. At a basic level, you can see specialization as loop and switching, but for any operation or even function calls. The idea is that you move all the conditions to the top, so that the bodies can have longer basic blocks. Instead of checking the type of the arguments for every operation, you check it once and then do all the operations according to these checks. This gets even better because using profiles, we can simply not compile any branch that you haven't seen in practice and so spare the code cache and enable more optimizations. We can even go further and write specialization manually, just like we do in Truffle. The reason to do this is that the optimization layer reasons at a very low level it's much more convenient to actually apply most optimizations. But because it's at such a low level, it does not know about high-level properties that we, the programmer, may know about. And so we can use that to write simpler, faster code. This is a bit abstract, so I want to give you a more concrete and visual example using Truffle. This will help recontextualize some of what we saw in Christian's presentation. So on the left, we have our example add operation, which works over integers and strings. On the right, I have transcribed this as a set of truffle specializations, which together form a truffle node. Now that this is pretty bad code, because if the objects were already string, then we call to string on them uselessly. Okay, so if A is a string, we call A to string, which is just a string, and vice versa for B. Here is the smarter version. Now we have a specialization for a case where we have two strings, and a specialization for a case where the left one is a string, and a specialization for where the right one is the string. And as you can see, we're able to remove the two string here and the two string here. And here, we don't have any two string at all. But for simplicity of the example, we'll use this dumb version with an integer specialization in a single string specialization. So we've used truffle, but I want to note that if you just run this without the truffle runtime, then the left and the right are essentially equivalent. The right version compiles to the left one uh, with some more function calls that might be optimized away. But once you add truffle, uh, good things will start to happen. So this explains what Truffle does. Here's a graph you've seen in Christian's presentation. So we have this tree, and let's imagine that every node is an add node. And here, 
U stands for unknown or maybe initialized. So basically, this node here, which uh, encompasses the whole tree, is this whole expression. These three nodes here is this. So, so basically, this node is this plus, right? This node here is this one. This node here is this one. And this node here is this one. So if you want to imagine the code for this tree, it's full of ifs. So we're going to run this code to collect some profiling feedback. And once we do that, we realize that the tree nodes on the left are always called with integers. So they always use the integer specialization because they add integers together. And the two nodes on the right, these always use the string specialization because this uh, will represent in a string. And since here the right one is going to be a string, it's going to use the string specialization as well. So if you imagine that we were to emit code at this stage, that's not how Truffle works, but let's just imagine that we emit code now. Each node will have guards that check that the specialization is indeed, for this case, an integer specialization, so that the arguments are integers. And we don't need to compile the other specialization. So in this node, we don't need to compile the string specialization. And in this node, we don't need to compile the integer specialization. What actually happens in Truffle when we do the partial evaluation and then a slew of optimization passes is that all specialization checks will basically be moved to the top, leaving us with a nicely optimizable basic blocks for uh, the whole operation. Now, of course, 1, 2, and uh, string A are constant. In the optimized version, there's actually no need for guards. They can be compiled away. But imagine instead that we're doing this on variables. And we've always observed that x was an integer, y was an integer, and z was a string. Then what will happen is that at the top, we'll have guards that check that indeed x is an integer, y is an integer, and z is a string. So what happens if one of our guards fail? Yeah, at some point we call this, but y is no longer an integer, but it's a string. Then we need to deoptimize and update the profile. And later, if we want, we can recompile based on this updated profile. So let's see a code equivalent to what we just saw. So we have an add node that performs the add operation, and its code is more or less uh, like this. So that was the code we showed before, but in addition, we first execute the left node, and we also execute the right node. This means that this method is recursive, because this here will call this, since in our example, both the left and right nodes are always add nodes as well. If we were to inline all these calls, then this code will be duplicated four times, because we have four nodes. Once you collect the profile and run through partial evaluation, you get the code at the bottom. So this part here is the guard, where we check that x, x is an int, y is an int, and z is a string. And then you get this, more, this much more reasonable code here, which is much simpler than uh, 4 times this, of course. This is not ideal yet, because we know that z is a string, so calling z to string is obviously useless. But the compiler should be able to inline the to string method. And it should be able to do so because we know that z is a string because we checked this here. So we can assume that z is a string. And because of that, this is a polymorphic call that is monomorphic. The implementation of toString that will be used is always the one that is defined in string. So the compiler can inline it. And because the toString implementation for strings simply returns the string itself, so basically just z, then the toString can be compiled away. And you end up with this code here which, as you can see, uh, removes the useless two strings. So our example shows specialization for the type of the parameter of an operation, but you can specialize on anything you can compute. The point is that these conditions can also lead to significantly simpler specializations. This allows us to create fast paths for simple cases and to isolate complex cases so that we compile them only if we really need them. Remember that adding compiled code is really bad because it bloats the code cache. For instance, in Truffle Ruby, it's written that we write specializations for the cases where an array or a dictionary is empty, as that considerably simplifies the logic for those cases. Even if the array is not always empty, it creates a very fast pass for empty arrays. 
Our example is that we can cache the encoding of a string, because many string operations depend on the encoding. We can also cache on the shape of an object, and the shape of an object is the structure of its fields. That's because in a language like Ruby or JavaScript, you can add fields to any object. But most objects just have the standard field layout that exists when the class was defined, and so we can optimize that case to be faster. Earlier, we said that we can cache values that are expensive to compute and stable. That is true, though in general, it is hard to know about that, and caching is best left at the programmer's discretion. In general, polymorphic inline caching is used for computation performed as part of the language runtime. For instance, in Truffle Ruby, we cache the result of method lookup. That's because method lookup is significantly more complex in Ruby and in dynamic languages in general. In Java, you just need the concrete type. But in Ruby, there are other factors that affect method resolution, and you can change method at runtimes. So we need to be able to invalidate the cache when methods are redefined. And for that, we use assumption object. We won't talk about them today, but uh, Christian talked about them in his presentation. In Truffle, these caches are often per specialization, as you may want to cache different things in different scenarios. But more interestingly, the specializations but more interestingly, the specialization condition can depend on cached values. And so for instance, for method lookup, you could have one specialization per cached method. And that enables making fast call to the known call target for that method. And with that, we're done with the video, and we're also done with the material for this course. I hope you enjoyed it. There will be a final video in which I will give you some parting words and give you some pointers if you wish to continue learning about languages and compilers. I'll see you all next time.